Hallelujah. Majesty. Majesty. Hallelujah. Majesty. King of kings. Yeah. Lord of lords. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. And we can worship him for that. We can worship him. That means that, that we bow and we worship. We're not cowering at his feet, but we're bowing to worship. It's a big difference. And we bow and worship because he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. That means that of all the lords and all the kings, that ever were and ever will be, Jesus will always be king of those kings. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. He is king. And it's essential that our hearts acknowledge him as king. It's awesome to be here this morning. I'm excited for the word of the Lord today. God has has set the stage this morning through Bible exploration for us to, to come to the place where I believe that he, he wants to say something to our hearts and to where we are that, well, there's no other way to say it, but that's something that we have got to hear. And um, yesterday I was thinking about it, and sometimes you can get the, the title of a message, and that's sort of the message flows from that. But I was struggling with the title, but knew what, what was to be said. And about 3.30 this morning, it's like, I'm wide awake, and there's the title for the message. And I titled this message, and it may well be more than one part, Beggars and Choosers. Beggars and Choosers. Now, we've all heard that, you, that beggars can't be choosers. Right? We've all heard that. In fact, we have said it. Right? But today I want to say, you, say to you that beggars are beggars because they did not choose what they should have chosen. Beggars are beggars because they did not choose what they should have chosen. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to get some hate email or anything like that and saying, well, Pastor, well, what about the guy down the street? I'm not talking about the actual beggar who's shaking a cup, but this may well apply to every kind of beggar there is. See, the thing is, we come to God asking. I don't know how it is when you go to God in prayer. Only you know, and God, well, God knows how it is when you come to Him and you approach Him in prayer. I don't believe that we should approach God as beggars. I believe that we should approach God as sons. That doesn't mean we come and approach God as brats. That doesn't mean that we come to God as spoiled children who know no bounds and do not understand who our Father is. It doesn't mean that we get to stomp our feet, wave our fists, throw a tantrum until the Almighty bows to our demands. But we don't come to God as beggars, we come to Him as sons. We come to God knowing the right relationship that we have with Him. But the one thing is that we are beggars because we did not choose 
to obey God. When we choose to obey only ourselves or people or something else, we will be left resorting to begging. When we choose God's ways, and this is where the choice comes in, we are either beggars or we are choosers, but when we choose God's ways, we don't need to beg. In fact, God has not called us to beg from Him to plead our case, so to speak, with many words. so that we could turn his ear. That's not what prayer is about. That is not what God is calling us to. You see, I want to make a bold statement today. That today, that I can solve all of your problems. Yeah, go ahead, Pastor. Solve my problems. How many of you want your problems solved? Yeah, only some of you. Well, that must be because you don't have any problems. That is awesome. You know, when I went to my dad growing up, I would say, Dad, I have a problem. And my dad would say what I didn't expect him to say. He would say, Oh, God! And that would shock me, especially the first time he said it. I have a problem, my dad says it's good. And then he would continue to say, I have many, I can give you some of mine. So if you don't have problems, I can give you some of mine. Now let me see again, how many of you have problems? Wow. Those who didn't raise a hand, please do see me after the service. I have a load of trouble to hand over to you. Anyway, for those who, who know that they have troubles, that they have burdens, that there are issues in their life, for you, I can solve through this message and the truth that comes through this message, I can solve your troubles and your problems today. Bold statement. You see, the most important issue in your life and mine today is obedience to God. Now, Pastor Jerry and I did not discuss our notes. We did not talk. Well, not, about that anyway. not about that anyway. Yes, we did talk. Right. But every problem you face in some way is related to this issue. Every solution in your life will be found in obedience to God. Every solution in my life will be found in obedience to God. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, sometimes I've got to be pretty disobedient. There's got to be things that I am disobeying God. And I've, I've been wrestling with this because I'm saying, God, you know that scripture which says, search me and know me and see if there be any. My version of this as I'm pressing through this, my version of this, see if there be any disobedience in me. See if there's any area where, where God, I have stubbornly refused. You see, for me, I should know the Word, and so when I'm not doing it, well, that is stubborn refusal. And that brings me to a dangerous place. But every problem I face is related to the issue of obedience, disobedience, but every solution can be found in obedience to God. Obedience to God opens up infinite wisdom. Oh boy, we can discover the, the wisdom of God in His Word. We can discover the wisdom of God 
in our lives in so many ways. But here's the thing is, I sometimes want to know all the details of my problems. I just want to know all the details. So that in the details, I can somehow find the solution. But I only need to know one thing, and that is that a loving, omniscient Father will tell me about it. That He will tell me, look, you, you've strayed. You, you've stepped over the line. You've, you've, you've passed the place of obedience and you have now begun to operate independently of me. God has made our lives simpler than we think. We analyze, we theorize, and we agonize trying to figure out what on earth are we going to do when all we really need to do is to hear His voice telling us what to do. What is He telling us to do? He's telling us go to the Word and obey what it says. Go to the Word, because therein you'll find the solution. You'll find the answer. And if you will do what it says, you will discover life will be simpler. Now, obedience requires faith. Obedience doesn't come from being told to do something and then simply towing the line. Obedience in, in terms of what God is saying to us is a matter of faith. It requires faith and it does that because what it does is it removes, it takes control away from me. The moment I say, God, I will obey you, what I'm doing is I'm putting my trust in Him and saying, God, your ways are better than my ways. You have a better idea. Lord, you have the best solutions. Lord, your answer is the only one that matters. So what I'm doing is I'm transferring the faith in myself, that's disobedience, to faith in God, which is obedience. Obedience requires faith. We have to trust the wisdom and the love of God for the outcome. And that's what Hebrews 11 tells us over and over and over again. This one did this thing, which if you go look in the, the, the history and the context of what they did, this person believed God and it was counted to them righteousness, but what they believed God was an actual action. It wasn't an imagined thought of, yes, I think I believe. No, it was an actual action. They believed God and they did. And there's always, and there was always an aspect of obedience to God in that matter. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It's right here in my notes. First Samuel 1522. You can take down these scriptures, you can read them at home. I'm not going to go over them today unless you want to be here all day. So, 1 Samuel 1522, but you can read the context around that. John chapter 14, verse 15. And 1 John 2 4. I think people still take notes in church, right? Obedience is better than sacrifice, but obedience is also better than religious activities. We've we got, we got a lot of religious activities. And not all of them are bad, right? Certainly, the fact that we do things religiously, repetitively, doesn't necessarily make it bad. What makes it a problem is when we do that instead of obeying God. Instead of 
honoring God. You can, you can do things, but your heart is far from them. You can, you can follow principles, but reject the one who gave those principles. And that was a problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They were highly religious, but they were all about their religion and not about their God. Obedience is better than religious activities. Matthew 5.20 Obedience also opens up the resources of heaven. Obedience opens up the resources that God has to us. Obedience brings and releases the supply. Well, I thought faith did that. Faith without obedience is going to get you nothing. Obedience without faith is going to get you nothing. And not, it's not about getting, right? But we, all, we can all understand those terms. Oh, I want to get. Give me, give me, give me. Get for me, get for me, get for me. Supply, supply, supply. That, that is our mentality. That, that, that's the way we tend to be wired. If it's coming to me, I want it. Well, there's a lot coming to us in the, in the Word of God. And if we want it, the key to having it is faith obedience, obedient faith. So obedience is in our design. Obedience doesn't, isn't something that, that God came and sort of says, well, you know what? You just have to obey from now on. Obedience was, is, is built into man's design. And God made Adam and Eve. What he did is in the design of these people who he made in his image, who he breathed his breath into, and they became living souls. They, they were alive and they were like him into their very design God put obedience. This is how this man, this woman, this creation of God would function. And that is from the beginning the design that God made. Now, he designed them to work in relationship with him, right? Absolutely. We know it's about relationship. He didn't design man to act alone without divine guidance and care. But that relationship in which the creature, Adam and Eve, submits and obeys to the Creator is what God put in the design. And the Creator in turn, protects and provides for the creature, Adam and Eve. It's in the design. It's in, it's in the manual. It is, it is the way God intended for you and I to function. God made us. He made us so that we will operate under His rules, His law, His commands, however you want to put them. And as we do that, God comes and He protects and He cares for us. That was established from the beginning. It still is true. It's a principle that exists and was established long before the law. It was established in Eden. It was established in paradise. It was established in perfection. It was established in an unbroken relationship with God. This is not new. It didn't come with Moses. It didn't come with the prophets. It didn't come with sin. Hear that. It came by design in creation. 
It's how we were made. It's how we are intended to function. Now, I've told the story so often how, how when, when I was kids, we would repair our bicycle tires and we would go to mom's cutlery drawer and pull out some spoons because the back of a spoon, the ones that she had, is not sharp. So you can poke it in the, the tire of the bicycle and you can pry off the the tire off of the rim without damaging the tube. But spoons are not meant to pry off bicycle tires, so the spoon faces some trauma. And then mom doesn't know why her spoons look like this. Well, we knew because the sons were using spoons that were meant for eating for repairing bicycle tires. Now, we don't, we don't think much of that, but how often do we use what God has designed outside of its design? And then we say, what's the matter with your design, O oh God? It seems like you made a mistake. It seems like you built a fault into it. God is not like a car manufacturer. That as soon as the warranty runs out, the thing rusts to bits. The transmission blows, the engine won't function, the catalytic converter is gone, and it's going to cost you hundreds, thousands of dollars. It's not worth keeping. No, God's not like that. He built eternity into the design. And in the design, He also built that we should obey. This is part of what it is. Now, I know obedience and obey are, are nasty words in today's climate. But remember, it is God who we must obey. It is God who we obey and we put Him first. We establish this as an absolute standard in our lives. It's not about, okay, so I have to obey everything and all around because the the obeying everything else is not in the design. It is obeying God that's in the design because that's how God made us. Now certainly that doesn't mean on the other hand I don't know if this is going to work, but it looks like the battery died. Um, but in the design is that we obey God, and that's how it works for us. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be anything other than our understanding that we obey God. God allows us to, in obedience to Him, to obey authority, to obey those others that have the rule over us. It's not complicated, but sometimes we make it that way. So by design, we are dependent on God. And there's only one source of life, and that is God. There's no other source, there's no other way to it. You know, the truth is that man, you and I, we cannot produce a life independent of God. The way we thrive is to draw from the life of God. And the only way we can do that is when we submit to Him. When we obey Him. We cannot function successfully in any other way. Now I know we've tried. And you had to be here at Bible Exploration this morning to know ways that we tried and we failed and we've got ourselves in trouble. We've recently looked at, in our Bible study time at John chapter 15, where Jesus instructs through, through 
talking about nature. He says that you have to abide in him. Abide in the vine. There is that, there's that thing. And, and that abiding in him is not, is not complicated for the plant. It's not complicated for the vine. It's not complicated for the branches. You're either in or you're out. And when you're in, the same life that flows through the vine flows into the branches. And without any effort, the branches produce fruit. It's amazing. Either in or you're out. Now, if you go and read John chapter 15, you'll see for those who are out, the outcome of being out is not good. And you'll see that through the same principle throughout scriptures. For those who are obedient to God, who obey the word of God, those who are in, well, that is, is not a problem. That's not, not an issue. But for those who are out, well, that does become rather complicated. Because when you look at Scripture, being out of the abiding, being out of the obedience principles of God's Word, leaves you up for destruction. The Bible's full of it. And, and as I said before, it's not just seeded and rooted in the Old Testament, the commands of God. Modern believing, believism, even in the church, wants to exclude this and say, well, we will not follow the law. We are not under the law. We're under grace. We're under... Absolutely. I am not denying that. I'm not saying that, that, that we, we are under the law. But we are still under Christ. We are still under what Jesus came to bring. And Jesus made no bones about it, that if we love him, we will obey him. We will keep his words. There is no, there's no option to, to um, disobey, to do something different. There isn't an option for us. It is ours to obey, abide in the vine. God created man to benefit from his infinite resources. What are they? Just, just, just quick, a few of them. Love, God's love. Is, is a resource that he makes available to us. His wisdom. His power. And from those, you can connect so many others to it. And none of this happens outside of the context of obedience. You can check it out. You can, you can come bring the scripture to me and say, Pastor, what about this one? And I can guarantee you that with just reading the wider context, we will find the obedience principle. It will be there. And by the way, just so that we don't misunderstand, that obedience principle will be a faith principle at the same time. So when God created Adam, He placed him in the perfect environment. He placed him there to enjoy. And what He did was He put Adam in the garden and He gave him one simple instruction. He required him only to do one thing. He merely had to obey this instruction. He had to obey God. And God provided the rest. God gave him everything else he needed. But it all kind of hinged on his obedience to this one thing. In Genesis 2.16, God gave Adam the command. He said, of every tree in the garden, you may freely eat. We know this so much that when we, when we read it, you're even like, yeah, we go again. But yes, it all begins in the garden. You may freely eat. But of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, 
you shall surely die. God gives the command and he lays out the consequence. He lays out what happens when you disobey. Adam was fully informed. And so are we. I was just reading an article. This is, this is a segue. Hopefully I won't go too long with it. But I was just reading something that some bishop um, in the 1700s calculated that the world, day one of creation, was October 23rd, 4004 BC. Now, Bishop Usher. Now, of course, they've, they've, they've gone and looked at his calculations and found out he was, he was a few days off. But imagine that. There's something to, to get people's minds reeling. I just found it interesting that it was October 23rd. So yesterday was the first day of creation. Um, that's fascinating to me. Anyway, enough of the segue. But there was, so October um, 29th, in the garden, God rests from all his work. Adam is made, Adam is given this command, and he has to do what God told him to. There you go. Now, I don't go by that date, because obviously there are... It's a complicated process to, to date something that accurately. Anyway. Okay, everybody come back. It's important to notice that the relationship that God has with Adam, God gave him one instruction. And in light of that command, Adam had one responsibility. One instruction, one responsibility. What was Adam's responsibility? To obey. Not complicated. Now you thought I was going to give you a complicated message today because I promised, made that bold statement, it solve all your trouble today. But some of you have no trouble, so I'm, I'm so excited. Okay. So this was, as I said before, this was before Adam sinned. God didn't come to Adam and say, now that you've sinned, you're going to have to obey me. Now that you have, you have done this horrible thing, now that you have, you have done what you shouldn't have done, you, now that you listened to the, the snake, now that you did this, now that you did, from now on you're going to have to live under the thumb of my oppressive rule. No! God never had Adam under the thumb of his oppressive rule. God gave him simply one instruction and Adam had simply one responsibility. And he blew it. But don't be hard on Adam. If you were Adam or you were Eve, would you not have blown it too? See, long before the law of Moses, God was giving commands. Adam was designed to reflect, reflect God's glory. How? Through his obedience to God. Adam was designed to receive God's provision. How? Through his submission to God. See, right from the beginning, obedience was required. God told Noah to build an ark when he was about to destroy the world because the people didn't obey God. The survival of the human race depended on, upon this one thing. One man's obedience to God's command. God gave Noah specific instruction on how the ark should be made. And the Bible says that Noah did... Wow, this, I, I'd love this to be said of me. i got some work to do. Noah did exactly what God told him to do. 
Twice we are told that Noah did all that God commanded him to do. Obedience is the central thing. And you know what? Noah obeyed God in this one instruction for just in the construction stage, 120 years. It wasn't a day. How do you say, I can obey God for a day? I can obey God for a minute. Noah obeyed God in the instruction, and he did all that God said over a long period of time. So don't say, oh, it's tough. Look to the men of faith. Because they obeyed, because they trusted in God's wisdom. God told Abraham to leave her of the Chaldeas and to go to a place that he would later show him. That would be kind of hard. I want you to pack up your house, sell all your goods, everything you can, stick it in your car. If you can't find your car, leave it behind. And I want you to hit the road. And by the way, when you get there, I'll tell you, you're there. How many of us want to go on a trip like that? Sounds like an adventure to me, right? But for those of us, like myself, who are a little more controlling than, than others, I want to know the destination because I want to calculate the cost, see what the tolls are going to be, and I want to know what I need to pack. Right? So you are a little bit more like me than Sarah. But here it is. Obedience. Simple obedience. Well, might not be that simple for us. Only because we don't want to obey God's clear instructions. Hebrews 11, 8 sums it up this way. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Faith is always expressed in obedience. James tells us that the so-called faith that does not act in obedience to God is a sham. It's fake. It's not real. James 2.14-26 through 26, True faith is always characterized through obedience. There's no way around it. God blessed Abraham and his offspring. Those who would come ahead of those who would come after him in what? In the context of obedience. God was affirming his promises to take care of Isaac, Abraham, his son Isaac, Abraham's son, Isaac, with this, this statement in Genesis 26, 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, commandments, statutes, laws given to Abraham all came before Moses. Not the law, but God's instruction that require obedience. It's important to realize how God has worked, how he designed you and I. You know what, and it's not just we who are believers that are designed this way. In fact, every living human being in the world, in the earth, alive today, is designed exactly the same way. And until we find a command to obey that comes from God and obey it, we will never truly live. We will never truly find life. 
God sets it before us as an invitation. But God's invitation is, come to me and live. And the implication is very clear. If you don't come to me, you remain dead in your trespasses and sins. You remain lost. You remain in that dreadful place facing judgment without any hope. That is the truth of it. So for those who know the power of obedience, we need to understand that this is not just for us to obey the, the niceties so that we can get all the, the fancy provision, all of the wonderful things that God promises to us. God's promises are to anyone who will come and obey His word. Okay, so obedience is in the natural relationship that we have toward God. But it is not based on the mosaic, Moses' covenant. So, through Moses, or the law of Moses, the emphasis on, on obedience continued... And God gives the Ten Commandments. And God goes on and gives more revelation about who He is and what He requires. And you're in Deuteronomy. Now, don't we love Deuteronomy 28? Yeah, but we don't love 27. Yeah, we don't love 27. And in fact, this later on in 28, there's parts that, that we don't like either. We just like the piece that says, well, these are the blessings that will come upon you. These are the things. But, but in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2, God is speaking here. He says, now it shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe, that's another word for obey, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You see, it's not, it's not a new principle. And it's not a principle that Jesus came and obliterated and said, okay, you no longer need to obey. You only need to have faith. You only need to, to you are only saved by faith and grace and it's, obedience is out of the way. No obedience is established in the design. It's established in who God is. And the new covenant doesn't negate it. Doesn't remove it. Are we convinced yet? Uh, Pastor, you said you're going to solve all my problems. You haven't solved anything yet. You've just made it feel more difficult. No, the, the solution lies simply in what I've shared. If I were to stop right now and say, well, that's it. We're, we're done for the day. The solution is right there for each one of us to live off of. What we need to do is we need to discover that what, what is our problem and then we find the biblical principle that relates to that problem. And then we look at what God says needs to be obeyed. Problem solved. Oh, we've got to deal with a lot of rebellion and stubbornness and, 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 and who knows what kind of stuff that happens in us to get to obedient. But that is the solution. To obey. We want to save our nation. We want to save our country. We want to save our town, our region. We have to be the first ones to obey because when our obedience is complete, then we're able to bring others, spirits, 
powers, principalities, we're able to bring them to obedience. But we have to begin in obedience. Yeah, this is not, not the kind of message that we, we love. This is the kind of message that we never listen to again. Um, Pastor, this wasn't your best message today. Please take these notes, tear them up, delete the file on your computer. Never look at them again. Right. But in all of the history of Israel, we see that the blessings came upon Israel, that they were successful as a nation, they were successful as a people of God, and, and the fear of the Lord was, was upon them and upon the nations that surrounded them as long as they obeyed the word of the Lord. They found peace, they found rest from their struggles in everything while they obeyed God. But as they drifted away, from obedience to doing it their own way, they found trouble. That's how we found our troubles. In Isaiah chapter 1, the nation of Israel is living in disobedience. And there was plenty of religious activity. They were going about it. They were going to the feasts. They were doing the new moon um, festivals. They were, they were on target with all of the things that they were supposed to do at the right times of the year. I mean, they, they didn't skip a beat. They were doing it following the religious things. So it looks like obedience. It looks like they're doing what God told them to do. See, that's the problem. Sometimes it looks like we're doing what God has told us to do, but what has happened is they have simply become religious rituals and there is no substance in it. We're not obeying God. We are simply following step by step. And you see, as I was contemplating this, there is somewhere a difference in 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 us simply obeying, in other words, following instructions, and there is, along with that, submission. It's important to submit, to come under God's hand, under God's rule, is essential for us, because what we can do through religious activities, we can, we can be very busy, but have no relationship. We can be like the kid that says, well, when his parents say, it's time out, go stand in the corner. They say, well, no problem. I just want you to know that while I'm standing in the corner, I'm sitting down on the inside. That is the way it is so often. Maybe not as blatantly as that. But God says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient. I love the fact that he puts in willing. If you are willing. Because sometimes we can be obedient, but not willing. Sometimes we can do what we are told, but with a heart of rebellion, with a heart that is not submitted, with a heart that is not with the one who's giving the instruction. And it's not necessarily an outright, oh God, I will, I will do what you say, so it looks like I'm doing what you say, but inside I defy you. That is not necessarily the attitude that we're having. It's just that, it, that what is going on is all for the show but not for the one to whom it matters. If I'm obeying God for you, if I'm living my life so that, so that you, can, you can think well of me, and that is all that it is, then I'm living a sham, I'm living a falsehood, I am living in deep hypocrisy, because it's God whom I obey, it's God whom I serve. And from that relationship comes how I live my life. Because that brings glory to God. 
That brings honor to his name. And it is the same for Israel. See, God made it so, so clear. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The choice is ours. It's pretty clear. We can obey God and he will take care of us. But there's an all. We can choose not to obey God. And then it it's all rests on us. It's all on me. I take full responsibility when I don't obey God. See, it's supposed to work like this. I obey God, do what God says. But if I refuse to operate in the way that God made me, and I rebel and go my own way, do things my own way, and things don't work out so well for me, God will still be God. But your life will be a mess. The world cries and says, where is God in situations? And God says, where are you in my instruction? Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says this, Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. New King James Version, that was the NIV, the New King James Version says, For this is man's all. The Hebrew takes it a step further and says, This is the whole man, the full ideal of a man as originally contemplated. What is? Now that we've heard it all, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the all, the whole duty of man. That's the original intent that God designed us with. Jesus says in Luke 11:28, Blessed rather are those who hear the word and obey it. Okay. We've all chosen. Well, maybe one choice. Many choices. But many of those choices have been choices to act independently of God. And if we're acting independently of God, those choices have been choices to not obey Him. Adam had only one instruction, and he disobeyed that instruction. He broke covenant through doing things his own way on that instruction. And that result was catastrophic. But for us, it's not that much different. We've been given instruction to obey the Lord our God. Have a look. Search. Ask God to search your life because, frankly, you know what, when you, when, when you and I are looking for our own troubles or our own solutions, we don't find them. Just like, like the kid who has to pick his own switch. Right? We can't find a good one. Because this one's too big and that one's too small and we don't want what's coming. Right? But... For us it is, let's choose the solution. Choose God. Choose to do things His way. And you know what? You'll never go without. 
You will never have a struggle. If you do, it will be with the world, but it will not be with God. Because he will not let you down. He will not leave you without. He will not leave you in a place where you have to figure it all out. He will be there. That is his promise. That is his word. But that is dependent on our obedience. We can trace all our problems to disobedience. We can trace all our successes to when we obeyed God. So today, my appeal to you, the altar call to you, the, the thing that we have that we can take home is, is the question is, will you, will I, will we together choose that we're going to do things God's way and that we will obey God in all things? That's our choice. Now I've got, I've got more to say and I will say it next time. But this is a good place to stop. This is a good place to say, yes, God, I choose. Today, I will obey you. Today, I I say, God, I will bring all my burdens, all my trouble, all the things that weigh me down, all the things that, that have me overwhelmed, every stressor, every problem, everything that I have, I will put it before you, God, and there I will Let you tell me what principle for each one of these things I must obey. It's all in the Word. You'll find it there. You don't have to know where every verse is. You just need a computer and Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever you use. Simply need to do a search. Or if you're old school, Grab a concordance, look it up, and you'll find that God has an instruction to obey for every one of your problems. Amen? So isn't that great? All your troubles are solved today. All your problems are settled. Isn't this an amazing day? And nobody's jumping up and down and shouting and and, and swinging from the chandeliers or anything. Doesn't make it less true. It's not the message we wanted to hear, but it's the one we need to hear. Because God is taking us from a place where we, we, we struggle and we don't live in the abundance and blessing of His covenant. And He wants to take us from where we go without to where we live in the abundance of blessings. Let's pray as we turn our hearts to the Lord. Father, we thank you that today, Lord, it is, it is so amazing how clearly you lay it out for us that we just need to obey. Lord, and, and, and that's a simple instruction in, from your word, but Lord, it's so complicated in our hearts. It's so complicated. We are so emotionally tied to to things we are so um, stuck in a rut. We are so um, caught in our own willfulness. Oh God, but today we have heard your word. And Lord, we want to take a step away from ourselves and walk to you and say, God, we will obey your commands. We'll do things your way, oh God. And thank you, Father, that in obedience there is blessing. Father, I pray, Lord, that the temptation that Adam had, that everyone has had since Adam, to do things their own way, Lord, that temptation, Lord, you would give us strength, you'd give us insight, 
and understanding that we will not choose our way over yours. We will not choose man's way over God's way. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.